I'm just thriller. Everybody is here to party. Oh, yeah. Greetings and welcome, fellow barium intimates, fluoroscopists, and cross table lateralists. I am your host, ah, Jones, and I am not a radiology technician. Nope, I'm a technologist, and I've been in this field long enough to know that. Just because you came into my emergency room at 2 a.m. with a chronic back pain times six years does not mean the x-ray should be static. This is the Radiologic Technologies Podcast for Rad Tech by Rad Tech. Thanks for listening. Hey, welcome to another episode of Live Q&A with Radiology Question and Answer. I'm your host, Ron Jones. I'm trying to get Milo on camera here. He's just sitting here staring at me. We got a five-month-old standard poodle. Um, you might wonder why I'm all dolled up. Let's see if I can pull up a picture. I was outside just a few minutes ago. And, uh, of course, I'm here in southern Idaho. And that's my Jeep and camper out in front of my house. We've got some snow dump going on. It's hard to focus. But... Um, it is a cold February morning, so I'm just going to hop on here. We've got a couple of people coming on board. Feel free to say hi in the comment sections, and I'm going to start a room over on Clubhouse because we uh, we do a Clubhouse room at the same time, and as I slowly get everybody moved over, um. What that enables us to do is get people to jump in the conversation with me because in Clubhouse, I can click a button to make anybody an admin along with me. You can have like 20 admins and well, where do I title it at anyway? Well, I'm on there and uh, anyway, you, you, we can all talk at the same time and we can answer questions for people. If, if I get an MRI question and there's somebody in the room that is an MRI tech full-time that wants to answer it, they can answer it. So, let's see if I got the snow off by now. My glasses turn dark colors in the bright sun, and of course the snow mimics that as well. And so they were black when I walked into the house. <sighs> Hello, AKFAX, <laughs> AKFAX. I'm doing great. Uh, like I said, just enjoying some snow. How are you doing, brother? We've got uh, another interesting week on the um, Facebook group. For those of you who may not know, I'll put a link down here. Bada boom, bada bing. That is the Facebook group where we all interact. Got some water droplets on the glasses here. So, um, I want to do a quick shout out. There's something that I came across on YouTube this morning. It is a video, and I highly recommend supporting other radiologic technologists in their platforms. And this happens to be a um, <clears throat> YouTube channel by a, a young tech, young rad tech right there named Kelly Grace. And Kelly is doing a video. It's actually four months old. I'm just now finding it. Um, in fact, I'm going to hit the subscribe button. Kelly is doing a pros and cons of working in the radiology field. Um, for nuclear medicine, what I've heard that it's usually two years for the whole program. And for radiation therapy, it's usually one year or depending which area you live in or which hospital or school has the program. So she's going through all the modalities, which is awesome. She admits in the very beginning she is still in x-ray school. So she's just sharing what she's learned so far, and I highly encourage that. You see, the more we do this, the more people understand what we do, and that begins to open the door to some respect that we have long, long sought after, huh, Milo? Uh, we are not the button pushers that we are made out to be. We are technologists who go to school for two years. We do hundreds and hundreds of hours, not just free clinicals, but we actually pay to go to those clinicals. 
And so we are a highly trained specialist and nobody else can do what we do. And the doctors can't do what we do. The nurses can't do what we do. Nobody, if I always said, if the, if the rad techs went on strike, the hospital would be forced to shut down because you think about those of you that are students and in the field, you think about how many patients come into the emergency room and there's, there's three things that happen on 99% on of them, right? One, the doctor evaluates them, primary, secondary evaluation, what's going on, what are the symptoms, how long has it been going on, that kind of stuff, get the history. And then what does that doctor order? Lab and x-ray or some form of medical imaging. And those two tools are what that doctor uses to decide what's wrong with that patient. So they cannot operate without us. Don't forget that when you are applying for a job, when you go to negotiate your pay, I had an interesting conversation on the blog the other day. It was uh, it was actually I think one of my one of the uh, what we'll call a sister blog. Um, another one that I recommend because the admin cares a great deal about radiology. His name is Chris Cotting. Big shout out to Chris. Big Chris. Here's a link to his his uh, Facebook group. Um, and the question was being posited. Um, it was about, it was about starting a new job, uh, and, and being nervous about it. And, um, I think she, maybe she had an interview and she was saying, wish me luck. I, I had my interview and I, I commented, don't forget to, uh, negotiate your pay. And somebody retorted, uh, you mean we should be lucky to have a job? And um, I followed that conversation. Yeah, right here. Amanda hopped on the Radiology Technologist Life Group and said, wish me luck. I applied to my first job for after I graduate in May. And here's some of the comments. Best of luck, good luck. And then I said, don't forget to negotiate when they offer you the position. And somebody said, negotiate what? With the laughing emoji. And I said, your pay. And then I linked to a YouTube video that I have titled Negotiating Pay After the Rad Tech Interview. And that same person said, new grad should be grateful just to get a job. And you want salary negotiations? And they gave the OK symbol. And I said, always, hospitals should be grateful. They have qualified candidates. Don't be a defeatist. See, we can't have this mindset that we get what we get and we don't throw a fit, right? You can't be that way or you'll get trampled on. And that's part of the problem uh, that's been happening to radiology for the last 30 years is we've become more valuable by learning more and more, um, learning more and more modalities and they give us an extra buck. So uh, trust me, they're making hundreds of thousands of dollars off of you being a multi-modality tech and they're giving us a buck extra an hour. <clears throat> Sorry, facts. I didn't see your question there. Uh, how many years does it take to become a radiologist? I've always struggled memorizing that answer. Um, and I'm, I'm always off. I, sometimes basically it's four years to get your bachelor's. That's your basics. And that gets you into medical school, <clears throat> which is four more years. And then that just basically gets you to be a general practitioner. Then you have to pick your specialist. So then you would do your rotations through surgery or pediatrician or whatever you choose to be, what type of doctor. So after those four years, then you would pick radiology, which could be two or three more years. So now you're up to 11 years, but then there's an additional and <clears throat> I forget what it's called, residency or something after that. And you can take it uh, even more special to a, to a deeper degree of specialty, if you will, and be like a neuro radiologist or an MSK radiologist or, or some kind of a specific radiologist. And so you're looking at anywhere from 11, 13 years, depending on all the programs and the fellow, there's fellowships, there's residencies, there's internships. Um, you can do all these little things for a year that adds on to your specialty. So I'd say between 11 and maybe maybe 14 years, something like that to be a radiologist. And in my opinion, 
they're not clamoring to get in like they used to be. They used to be that job used to guarantee you, you know, half a million or more a year. Uh, easy, uh, sometimes more than a million a year, depending on where you work. You know, the big cities always pay more, but it's not that way anymore. And you're, you're doing a lot more and you're getting a lot less, just like the rest of us. We're, we're doing more work for less money and people are getting burned out. So do me a favor and hit the like button if you can. And so to continue that conversation with uh, LJ, who was telling me that we should just be grateful for our job. Um, after I said, don't be a defeatist, you know, don't be defeated by this. Don't, don't just take what you get because I, I, I do in that video negotiating pay after the rat check interview, the, the, the dirty little secret that a lot of you don't know. And it, and it really makes sense if you just think about it, but you don't realize it until you're on the administrative side. Once we as administrators have gone through all the trouble of interviewing and and selecting and doing background checks and all these things you know it takes a, it could take a good three months to hire a person by the time you go through all the, the stuff if we pick you and we say hey we want to offer you the job at 20 bucks an hour if you say i, I want 20 dollars and 50 cents an hour we're, we're not going to say never mind we'll go with our second pick that has never ever 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 happened because what we'll do is just counter offer. We'll just say, you know, uh, sometimes we'll blame it on HR. We'll blame it on finance, whatever. We'll say, oh, you know, or, or we'll say, let, let me think about it. Because it's usually it's HR you're having these negotiations with, not the directors, not the director of the department. It's HR that's calling you saying, we'd like to extend the offer of full-time radiologic technologist for $20 an hour. And we'd like you to start on March 1st. You, What I, what I coach is that you – are very grateful for the opportunity and you're very excited about the possibility of working for the company because your research shows that it's such a great place to work. But after some calculations or, or you pause them and you say, let me think about it. Let me talk to my spouse about it. Give me a day. And, and that's allowed. You don't have to make a decision right there on the spot. It's allowed to take some time and think about it. And so you, um, uh, our wage for radiologists. Oh, I don't know. Those guys, stupid money uh i can't even tell you an hourly they're they're easily now they're easily three hundred fifty thousand a year depends on how they're paid uh facts it depends on if they're hospital owned or or if they're on their own group if they're on some kind of a, a share plan within their group it, it's pretty complicated the way they get paid you work in the group for so many years as a as a newbie and after so many years, you're you're considered a, a I forget what it's called, but you're considered a part of the practice, a partner. And when you're a partner, you get a percentage of the whole pie plus whatever you get paid. But um, when you're when you're offered that position, you you should take 24 hours to decide, and then call them back. And because uh, the last thing you want to do is, is yeah 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 I'll take it I'll take it I'll take it yeah 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 uh, don't don't be desperate. Uh, even though you might be desperate and a lot of us were desperate when we got our first jobs and that that's that's the mentality we're hung up in is we just finished two years of school we're beat it wore us down we just want a job so we can get started well congratulations somebody's already interested in you so take a breath take 24 hours to think about it and discuss it with your spouse or your friends or your mentor or whatever and then come back and say you know I, i'm really grateful that you offered me this opportunity and i've been doing a lot of the the math behind it and because I'm going to be living over here in this town or because I'm going to be driving for five eights instead of three twelves or because of whatever reason, I'm, I'm going to be spending a little bit more gas than I thought, or uh, I'm going to be living in a town. I'm in, I'm in Sacramento where the cost of living is a little bit higher or whatever. I would really appreciate if you guys could bring to the table an, an extra 75 cents an hour just to help me pay for daycare because I'm going to have to have my child in daycare so I can work the day shift or whatever, and hit them back with a, a counter offer. And, and one of two things is going to happen when you counter offer. Um, they'll probably say, well, most likely they'll say, let us get back to you. Um, because they know they have the money. Uh, every now and then they'll just say, nope, nope, you know, we can't. We just, uh, we know we don't have the money. And so they'll just say, nope, we can't at that point. You just accept. Okay, well, then I'll accept your original offer. But usually one of two things will happen. They'll say, let us get back to you. Um, 
or I forgot what I was gonna say. Let us get back to you, or um, or they'll accept it right away because they know they have it. Because they they know what the range is. They know what they can pay you, and they're never gonna come out and offer you the highest they can possibly offer you. Never. That's like going to a car lot and you see the sticker on the price of the car and you say, I'll pay that. I want that car and I'll pay that price on that sticker right there. No, you negotiate and you bring that price down as far as you can. But just like those car salesmen that will tell you, you know, the first round of negotiating, they'll, they'll put the full price on that paper and say, here's what we can do. And they'll write all over that paper. Same thing in HR. They'll say, well, we're going to offer you $20 an hour because that's what they want to pay you. Then you counter offer, but don't get ridiculous. Don't ask for five more bucks an hour. Think about about a three percent raise is, is what you should get annually if you work at a good facility. So do the math on it. Maybe ask for a buck. It depends on how much. If, if you're up in the thirty dollar range because you're in California or New York or or something like that, but I, I'd say probably fifty cents, seventy five cents. And it may not sound like it a lot, but but counter offering does two things for you. It shows that you've got guts and you believe in yourself and if you get it that 75 cents an hour adds up over the year to be a couple extra thousand dollars in your pocket that you wouldn't have had had you not asked so counter offer proudly say i really appreciate the offer i really want to work here i did some math i'm gonna to have to do some daycare i was wondering if you wouldn't mind going to to twenty dollars and 75 cents or 21 dollars instead of twenty dollars i would greatly appreciate it if you, if you need time to think about it, I understand and I, I look forward to your response. And then if they come back to you and say, let's say no, because I don't know if I made this clear, but they're never going to look at a counter and say, never mind, we'll go on to the next person. Not if you, not if you do it politely. I think they expect that really. Uh, a seasoned, experienced HR person will expect a counter offer. A lot of people just don't do it. So you'll counter, they'll say, well, let us see what we have in the budget and we'll call you back. And I've had them say yes and I've had them say no. But even when they say no, just because you countered and they say no, doesn't mean the job offers off the table. They still want to hire you. They still spent all that time interviewing you and researching you and doing your background checks and your drug screens and maybe fingerprint checks, whatever. The job still stands. So just because they say no to your counter offer doesn't mean the job offer's gone. If they say no, then you just say, well, okay, I can understand. It's been tough with COVID and I can see where budgets might be tight. I will accept the $20 an hour. And uh, what what did you say that starting date was? And you move on. And that's the way you should negotiate. You never, you never have to take what you're given. That's kind of life. You never have to take what's given to you in life. You can always counter. So to finish that conversation on Facebook, um, after I said, don't be a defeatist, uh, Kiliana chimed in and said, Ron, thanks for the link to that video. I tell my students all the time not to fall into that. You should be grateful that the hospital is considering you trap. That's how they take advantage and overwork and underpay you. She gets it. She's a, she's a teacher in a rad tech program. And I replied to her, yes, no, you are valuable and be proud. Counter offer. They already picked you. Question is, will they give you an extra quarter? If not, just accept the original offer. And so this was a, a great example of, of many things. This is a great example of a Facebook group where we're getting together and we're having conversations and you have opposing views. And the person who posted now gets to see these different points of view from within the radiology field. Whereas years past where we didn't have these platforms or we had them and we didn't talk on them as much because our hospitals would kind of browbeat us about don't post anything on social media and you'll get written up and you could lose your job. Well, th those days are coming to an end. You, you still have to be careful what you do and say, especially if you're videotaping in the hospital or taking pictures in the hospital. But Talking about pay, for example, they used to tell me, you're not allowed to talk about your pay. You're not allowed to tell your coworkers what you make or ask them what they make because it's just bad for morale. Well, why is it bad for morale, boss? Because you're paying somebody else more than the other person, and that's unfair practice. That's why it's bad for morale. So these Facebook groups are gold when it comes to checking out the field of radiology or being in the field of radiology and just asking questions. Oh, there you are. Jessica's on on Clubhouse. I hear you talking. And I'm going to 
Mute the kids, but you can unmute yourself, I think. Um, so thanks for the thumbs up. We got some questions in the comments section. Uh, do you prefer do you prefer for your hospital to be busy, slower in the middle? All, always busy. Um, of course, it depends on how much homework you have, right? So I, I did the night shift for probably close to 10 years. And um, that's where I got a majority of my homework done because I went back through ultrasound school as well. So um, you want to be busy because you don't want to sit around and be bored. But if you find other things to do, it's not so bad. I was at a 20-bed hospital in Mesa, Arizona, and there would be nights where we didn't have anybody at all, any patients at all. And there'd be other nights when we had plenty. So on the nights that it was slow, um, I would work on my homework or I would do some other things that I had kind of going on the side that were on the computer. Um, and my wife's the same way. Uh, she would prefer to have a busy day and stay busy doing x-rays. She's an x-ray tech in an, in an outpatient clinic, uh, doctor's office kind of setting. And it just makes the day go by faster when it's busy. Plus, you know, we do what we do because we like it. So when we get a good challenging, um, she had one, uh, well, we've had, we've had difficult ones in the past where it takes a lot of uh, skill to get a good view of that patient. And, um, that's what we like, a good challenge, you know, how can we move the tube to a certain angle and how can we position the patient and what technique is the best technique? Uh, and then, you know, every, every blue moon, you get a radiologist that says, good job. And that always feels good too. Uh, Amanda tips to prepare entering a rad tech program tips on doing well on the program interview. Hey, I got all kinds of articles and stuff on that. Let me, uh, let me take a quick peek, see if I can't find one or two of them for you. One place you can always go, and I'll post this in the comments section down here, is my blog, theradiologictechnologist.com. And on the top corner, top right corner is a search box. And, for example, I'll plug in the word interview and hit enter uh, and scroll down. Let's see. Uh, where do I have, I have, I have one. Oh, you know what it is? There's a couple of them. There's my uh, post about Jackrabbit Joe. Jackrabbit Joe was an x-ray student who figured out his master plan on how he was going to get the job of his dreams, which was about three hours north, uh, up in Flagstaff. Did that one link properly? Let me try that again just to make sure. Copy link address. Yeah, it's just not showing the whole link. So there's, um, hey, pumpkin. She's not feeling too well. She's got the, the yucks. We're on like day five. Um, so interview questions, you know, check my blog and the YouTube channel because I list. In fact, one of the first um, videos that I did was a reverse engineering of the interview process. If I sort by oldest and I go back to the beginning, one year ago, copy link, this is my bald head with no facial hair. I look completely different. But uh, reverse engineering the interview for Rad Tax job because I share some questions with you and you can always Google the, um, you can always Google common questions. Uh, but I list in some articles the questions we actually ask um, in, in the rad tech uh, positions that I've worked in as admin. And, but in that video that I linked, I tell you what they're looking for in the questions, what they're looking for in the answers, and why they're asking the questions. Things about teamwork and what do you do in, under conflict and stress and things like that. So, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole video. So let me see if I can summarize tips to prepare entering rad tech program. Um, so you're already past the interview part for the program and you're entering the program. I would say um, know where the clinical options are and start preparing for clinicals, start preparing to know which clinicals you want to choose because that's huge when it comes to your success as a tech 
you should be able to ask your program, even even as early as the interview to get into the program, um, ask where the clinical rotations are. And then look those up and decide which ones you want to go to because there's there's a lot of different theories or philosophies there, right? You want a level one trauma for all the experience, but you like the, the critical access hospitals because they're slower and you can get more one-on-one -on -one time with your mentor, your clinical instructor. <clears throat> you can also get different hours uh, depending on where you're at. These level one traumas, might they'll probably shove all their students eight to five or seven to four or something like that but there should be a second shift you can do. And and depending on what the rules are nowadays, they used to not be allowed to take students past like 10 or 11 o'clock. <clears throat> I had a clinical rotation that was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I got to hang out on the weekends and that's how I learned CT as an x-ray tech because the clinical instructor, Captain James Shepard at Mesa General, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he was x-ray and CT. And it was just him and me and one other guy, uh, Eric Harold, who, Later went on to work for a, a, a GE OEM and sell C arms, which is a, another cool aspect you could do as a tech. But uh, Jim, when we weren't doing X-rays, <clears throat> excuse me, and we were doing um, a CT, would pop up. He'd take me with him and say, "Here, let me show you how to do the CT." And so by the time I graduated X-ray school, I got hired as a CT tech at one at that at that clinical rotation spot. I got hired there as full time. CT x-ray, CT pay. I sat for my CT boards. I passed those. And so your clinical rotations are a very important aspect of, of your schooling. So to just kind of wrap that up, because I could go on and on about what to do to get prepared for it. So that, that's why I deflect you to the blog and the YouTube channel. But um, to prepare for the Red Tech program, just, just get ready to really hone in on your schedule, get a good day timer, or whatever your process is. I don't think I have mine here with me. I had a, a daily, weekly, day timer, the old school kind you carry in your hand. Um, so I could write out hour by hour everything I was doing because I literally had to schedule sleep time because I was working full time, going to school full time, had a family and all this other stuff. So I would budget hour by hour for, for two years I did that. Um, and you don't always stick to it. Come here, you little turkey. You come over here and say hi. Come here. Come here. Come here. There you are. Gotcha. <laughs> Come here. Say hi to Milo. Milo likes to sit next to me and chew on my hand when I'm not paying attention. But today I got you on camera, didn't I? You little snort. Hmm? Say hi. All right. Get out of here. Here's your ball. Look. All right. So, a little distraction there. Um, where are we at? So let's go back up. That's the tips to prepare. Hi from India at Rizwan. I'm going to complete basic chronology course three years and one year internship. Can I get a job? Um, yeah, that's the thing about different countries. It's, it's completely different everywhere you go. Um, in America, it's a two year program. Um, beware of the other programs that are shorter, but in America it's two years and you come out with an x-ray license as long as you pass your board exams. We have to take national board exams over here, but that's a good example. How over in uh, in uh, I'm guessing India, maybe it's a three year course and a one year internship. And uh, MRI is a great way to go, Rizwan. If that's what you want, MRI is, is good money. They pay really well. Um, it gives you fascinating images. Uh, you know, one of the neat things about being a tech is once you get to know what you're looking at. A lot of people outside of our world don't know what we're looking at. And MRI is no different because the MRI, MRI cross-sectional images are similar to CT, but different. Uh, the different fat sats and the different ways it can tint and change the colors of different tissues uh, make it different to read than, say, a typical CT. So it's always fun. Uh, each modality is cool in its own unique way. Glocka says, hey, hey, what's going on? Zesty's on uh, the topic of RAD Facebook groups. I kicked tires on RAD programs through Facebook. Found people that went to the schools I was looking at and asked them what they thought. Oh, yeah, great idea. So there's people on here that you can say, hey, I'm looking at going at a, people are even naming specific schools in specific t states. 
And people will chime in and say, yeah, I went there and I liked it or I didn't like it or here's what you will and won't like about it. And so that mixed with people jumping on saying, I'm moving to Texas. It, can anybody tell me what the starting pay is for a three-year experience CT Tech in Dallas? And people will pop on and tell you. I mean, where do, you never used to get that before on, until these platforms came along. And that's where it's important that you guys tell your friends and colleagues about these Facebook groups because the more people we get on there, of course, the less we can talk about them, right? But the more we can share information, uh, and the jack wagons usually don't join these things anyway. I got there's one guy that bounced around all the groups that got kicked out of every single one of them, but one because all he did was just slam everybody and everything, and it just got so old. But that's why we moderate, right? And and it helps me if you guys tell me there's a jack wagon on there talking smack, I'll remove them. Or if um, if people are on there asking really weird questions, like asking for diagnoses, we don't do that. That's not in our skill set. Uh, I'll politely take them out of the group. This group, our group is for anybody in the field from professors to students to technologists. Um, I'll let vendors in to look around and maybe ask questions, but no sales. We get enough sales in all of our other channels. Um, but I do encourage anybody in the field who uh, makes their own widgets or uh, promotes their own widgets. Like there's a book on there right now by a radiologist. He wrote a fabulous book about seeing people's lives through the radiology lens. Uh, he's on there. If you make your own markers, post them on there. Um, if you make mugs, masks, shirts, whatever, I highly encourage you guys always have a second home-based business that you can make a little bit of money on because you never know when something like COVID is going to come along and force you home. And uh, many places were forced to use their own PTO if they wanted to earn a living while they were quarantined. So I always encourage home-based businesses, do your thing. Uh, in a way, this is kind of my home-based business. It just doesn't make any money. This channel's not even monetized, but I digress. Uh, let's see, we're saying um, Zesty's in Houston and we got South India, uh, cute doggo. Um, Amanda, you're welcome for the links. Let's see. Uh, can't believe the Packers lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a student in a radiologic logist program, my third semester. So you're wrapping it up. So Zesty's almost done. Um, and you can come to the groups and say, what can I do to prepare for my boards? What can I, what's a great way to study? And of course, I have uh, really in-depth articles on how to set up your studies. I mean, I've got one really long one that's titled like how to prepare for your ART boards. And it talks about your quiet space, talks about what kind of music, talks about scientific methods that have been studied to help you <clears throat> study better and learn better and retain longer. Like the, uh, the egg timer method is one of them. You set an egg timer for 25 minutes. You study for 25. When it goes off, you get them to go for a five minute walk. Because studies have proven that if you sit there and just cram, that's what we used to do a long time ago. We just stayed up all night long at Denny's drinking coffee and cramming the whole semester. And then we'd take the final course we'd pass and then we'd brain dump it all. But that's not the best way to learn the material because this, this is for your career. This is for your profession and your, and your livelihood. So you want to retain as much as you can. The best way to retain it is to learn in short spurts and take a break. You will retain more. It's scientifically proven. So let's see, uh, where are we at? These guys are talking in the side panel. I applied to the Rad Tech program, waiting to hear back from them. Videos are very helpful. Thank you for sharing. Hey, and stop by anytime. Uh, my, my blog has a contact page and I'll plop that down. You're always welcome to shoot me a, a message right there and let me know what specific questions you might have. I've helped people with interviews. I mean, they they um, have a homework assignment where they have to interview somebody in the field and ask certain questions. Um, they have to do a paper about a, about a topic and they need help picking a topic. Um, of course, you can ask all that stuff on the Facebook group too, just, just as much. And uh, if anybody's interested in joining us on Clubhouse, there is a uh, about four invites still left. 
for us to give out on Clubhouse. See, Clubhouse is invite only. It's the frustrating part. So until you get invited, you can't get in there. But but we've got some invites. I think they get refreshed every week if you give them out. <clears throat> I've invited about three people so far. So if you're interested in a Clubhouse invite, use that contact link. Send me your information because there's a couple steps you have to – I have to have your contact information in my phone and you have to have mine in yours because Clubhouse in the app where you, when you send out that invite, it has to, it looks to your contact list to see if you know that person. And as long as that's a yes, then it sends that invite out. You can't just invite random people. So let me know if you're interested in that. Do you think, uh, Lonnie said, do you think I should study regular physics before x-ray physics? No, I think you should study x-ray physics before you study x-ray physics because why Why waste your time? Physics is a huge field. So why waste your time looking at things that may not help you? Um, I mean, if you want to take a 101, it depends on how much time you have. If you want to take a 101 physics, go ahead. That will help you have a better understanding of the basics of physics. But for the most part, you know, x-ray school and ultrasound school and nuke med school – they all tailor their stuff to their program. So the anatomy and physiology that we learn in x-ray is kind of tailored towards the, the world of x-rays. Uh, physics, for sure, is tailored towards the anode and cathode of the x-ray tube and the things that we use in the x-ray world. Um, you can also start learning the, the medical terminology because medical terminology is a huge part of what we do. And if you, you know, the, the trick to medical terminology is learning the root words and the endings, right? Like an ologist is a person that studies something. And then if you if you learn uh, that RAD is the world of radiology, so you see radiologist, you know, that is a person that, that studies the world of radiology. Um, and you can start to see, you'll start to see words in, as a student and not know what they are, but if you took the time to study medical terminology, you can look at the root words and the endings and kind of figure it out. Um, you know, itis and ending I-T-I-S means inflammation. So whenever you see something itis, it means it's the inflammation of whatever that first root word was. So I recommend medical terminology as one of the things you can kind of start prepping um, before the program. Uh, let's see. Rizwan, I'm just going to complete my three-year radiology course. Can I can I make experience in American MRI? What about the salary? Yeah, so that's the thing. You, you can't learn radiology outside of America and come here and start working. You have to be licensed here by the organization that licenses uh, technologists in America, and that's the ARRT. Um, the ARRT, as far as I know, doesn't let you just walk in and take the test if you have a degree somewhere else. You have to go to an accredited program that's accredited by uh, the the Joint Commission. I, no, that's who inspects us. Who is it? I can't think of it right now. Is it JCERT? JCERT is the organizing body that says this is an appropriate rad tech school. And then you finish that program and you take the board, you pass the board, you get a license, then you can work in America. Now, the dirty little secret is there are a handful of states in America that don't require licensure. So if you learn how to do ultrasound somewhere else outside of America and came here, could you practice? Yes. You can find a doctor's office somewhere that doesn't require licensure, that wants to pay somebody less than what they're worth, because if they hire somebody without a license, they know they don't have to pay full price. Here in Idaho, we're dealing with that. There's no state licensure required here. And there are still doctor's offices out on their own that will hire someone to take an x-ray or to be an x-ray person and they don't know anything about what they're doing. They just have a, a list on the wall of techniques and the doctor orders a hand. They kind of basically know what to do with the hand as far as positioning goes. And they look at the wall and say, well, in, in this view, this is the technique. So that's what I push and they don't understand. And so at the local hospital, we would get images. I remember, I'll never forget. I got a clavicle one time. This young kid, I think he was like seven years old. They sent the kid over because they could see a fracture in the clavicle, but they also sent the images with the kid. And the images uh, had a shot up here, a shot down here, a shot over here. And then finally, they kind of got, you know, a clavicle should be about right like this. And there's an AP and an axial view to, to see it in two different angles. 
And so they got lucky and got a part of this fracture, which told them there's the fracture. So then what do they do? They just send them to the hospital where a real technologist takes the images, which means double the dose for the patient, right? And then it gets done properly. It's a waste of time for the patient. They paid money for that x-ray that didn't do them any good, really. And now they got to come to the hospital, see a new new doctor and get new x-rays and, and a radiologist has to read it. And so it's really in everybody's uh, worst, uh, uh, what's the word, interest to go to these places that don't have licensed technologists. Of course, the general public doesn't know they're not licensed. I went to the Capitol one year when we've been pushing for a state license for a while. And uh, the year before I was president of the state society here, um, I went up to the Capitol and I took those x-rays. I made sure I anonymized them. I took them in a light box and I sat in the middle of this big hall and as the senators and, and representatives walked by, I said, hey, I'm Ron. And I told them who I was and I said, check this out. Here's some x-rays. Did you know that uh, we are taking uh, people are taking your x-rays that aren't licensed that never went to school for it? And uh, everybody was shocked. They had no idea that that could even happen. People's general opinion or thought process is when they walk into a medical facility, everybody that worked there has been to the proper school to do what they're doing. And that's not the case in at least five states still. So anyway, that tangent was because somebody from outside of America is asking about coming here to do MRI. So yes, you could come here to do MRI at one of these places that don't require licensure if you could demonstrate proficiency. Um, let's see. So back to the Facebook group, we're about 41 minutes in. Hit the uh, like button if you don't mind while you're in there. And uh, we're done talking about how to negotiate your pay um, when you do get picked from a job interview. Um, I will, I will, let's just chat just a minute about the Super Bowl commercial, shall we? The uh, Rockstar Energy Drink, so the ASRT, uh, bless their heart, uh, put out a post saying one of our own is going to be in a uh, Super Bowl commercial and they're celebrating uh, the Rad Tech. And I got all excited because we don't ever hardly get any recognition. And I started sharing that post before looking at it, which you should never do. And I finally went to find the commercial and was was pretty disappointed, really, in a lot of ways. And here, here's the thing. So Rockstar, it's a uh, Lil, Lil Baby is uh, a rapper. And he's talking about how hard he's had to work to become who he is. And um, during the commercial, they flashed to some professionals who actually had to go to school to do what they do. They didn't, they didn't just start rapping and become an overnight sensation without going to school. And one of the people they flashed to is this licensed rad tech who also happens to be a model and has a modeling career. And I'm sure that's how he got picked. But he is a rad tech, and I have seen his name mentioned before. So I thought, okay, somebody probably saw him. You know, they're looking for somebody healthcare. They're looking for a model. They found this guy, and he happens to be a rad tech. But then you watch the commercial, and not only is it literally like a one-second flash of this gentleman who's a rad tech, but if you look at him in this picture, did you guys see this? Post in the comments if you saw this. What's he wearing? He's wearing scrubs, and he's wearing a, a hat, surgical cap, and then around his neck, he's got a stethoscope. Rad techs don't use stethoscopes. Not unless you're in a clinic also being asked to do 15 other jobs that aren't really your job, because that is possible, but we don't use, we don't use stethoscopes. And then you see in his pocket a pin and a pin light. A pin light as in the kind the doctors use to look in your eyes uh, you know you start out here and they go in and they go out and they're looking for pupil response um we don't do that that is not a rad tech responsibility and so i sl it slowly dawned on me no this is not celebrating a rad tech at all they took somebody who happened to be a rad tech and put him in scrubs and a surgical cap and a stethoscope and a pin light to make him look like average joe in healthcare. And he got the job of being in this one second clip on a Facebook, I mean, on a, a Super Bowl commercial. So very disappointed. 
I mean, I guess I'll take what I can get because the ASRT did put some publicity out there that one of our own is in a Super Bowl ad. But why did he let them take a picture of him wearing a stethoscope and with a pin light? That's misrepresentation of a rat tick, if you ask me. And why would he allow that? Because he wanted to be in a Super Bowl ad because he's a model. That's why. So anyway, props to you for getting in a Super Bowl ad, but I wish it would have really represented us as rad techs and not the general populace. Again, the doctors and the nurses are always in the ad. So whatever, we're, we're the unsung heroes. That's what we are. It's what we do. And that's why you don't accept the first pay to go back to our earlier conversation. Don't accept what they offer you. you always counter offer because we're worth our weight in gold. So let's see, Zesty, yeah, between swigs of beer, I bet nobody knows. Yeah, if you even saw him flash on there, nobody would have known that was a rad tech based on what he was wearing. It was just another healthcare worker. Um, in fact, I saw one comment said, hey, who's the surgeon? So, um, so you have Instagram, I've sent... Uh, yeah, so I, I have Instagram and Twitter and all that other stuff. I just don't use it very much. It's enough to keep track of this channel and the blog. And, and uh, you know, I constantly watch Aunt Minnie for new articles and things like that. So let's hop over to our Facebook group and see what is going on to, with my fellow barium animists. So there's Dr. Ruff's book, Looking Within, Understanding Ourselves Through Human Imaging, uh, five stars on Amazon, and Chelsea's asking, although I'm planning on returning to school next January, what books do I need to get to study ahead and be prepared? <clears throat> That's kind of tough because... You know, it's specific things. You, you can ask your program what your books are. You can always get your books ahead of time. Um, Desiree said your program might offer a book bundle at a decent discount if you wait. I would start watching positioning videos on YouTube, start with chest, and move on to upper and lower extremities. So that's great advice. You have to be careful. Make sure the person you're watching knows what they're doing. Um, check out X-Ray Ray if you haven't seen him yet. Let's pop over to X-Ray Ray for a minute. I always give a shout out to X-Ray Ray because he's another one of us uh, and he's sharing information and he has some positioning videos on there and I would trust him. And so here's X-Ray Ray. So that was good advice to check out positioning videos and uh, again, start learning your medical terminology. And then uh, let's see. Ryan asked, were any of you guys hesitant to going into this field because you didn't know how you may react to gore or trauma? So that's a concern to some people um, because you most likely will see it if you're in a hospital setting. You, there's lots of places that x-ray techs can work. You can, you can work in a mobile company and have a van and drive around to people's houses and nursing homes and wheel your little mobile unit in there and set a plate up and take an x-ray and move on to the next facility, you'll never see gore or trauma in that, in that respect. Outpatient imaging centers typically don't. Um, you'll see them after the doctor's already splinted them and in for a follow-up. Uh, doctor's offices won't. Um, the only place you're really going to see it's going to be in a hospital location. And I would say for the most part, you probably get conditioned to, to be used to it. But I have other articles on that as well about decompression and how you need to learn how to talk to each other on the team. Uh, Cause you, you know, I've seen some really nasty stuff, some stuff that you can't unsee like children drowning and things like that. And the hospital should have a program set up to help you decompress. Uh, and they, not all of them do, or they may have a program and they may offer it to you, but you don't know what to say and you don't want to go and you, you don't know that person or whatever you don't attend. And so you've got these issues of that you're struggling with because of the, uh, paternal abuse or spousal abuse or these things that you see in infant abuse. Um, so I've got some articles on that. It's in my burnout article, the 13 ways or 11 ways you can burn out. I give two ways to re reverse those burnouts for each one of those. Um, I give a national talk on that one. 
but uh, you need to learn how to decompress and talk to other people. And so, you know, as far as Ryan's question on, on gore and trauma, I say most people, I'd say most people um, don't mind it because it's kind of interesting. And that's, if you're in the medical field already, you're kind of interested in that kind of stuff. And so, um, but I tell you, my wife didn't like needles when she first started out. They'd make her pass out if somebody was uh, poking her with a needle or uh, we got tattoos on our wedding anniversary and she passed out. But um, she's been an x-ray tech for like 10 years now. And she's at a hospital or, or has rotated through a hospital. So, you know, I think it's something they start to kind of get used to in x-ray school because you should be learning phlebotomy in x-ray school, which means sticking each other with needles and drawing blood, that kind of thing. So you kind of start getting your feet wet, but you're not prepared for what you're gonna see until you see it. I remember the first time I was in a trauma bay and somebody had had, anytime you're in a impact in a car that drives you forward, like say you run into somebody really fast, a head on collision or something like that, the way the feet sit down on the floorboards, typically they break and and the, the bones come straight through and the foot's hanging off to the side. Not to be gory, but that's what happens. And so a patient was laying on a gurney, and I walked past it. And I had to take an x-ray of that foot hanging off to the side. And somebody walked past me, and the whooshing effect of the wind blew that smell of blood and tissue up in my face. And I, I wasn't, like, going to lose it or anything, but I'll, I'll never forget that smell and thinking how raunchy that was and how nothing else smells like that. Um and I, you know, you can't be prepared for that kind of thing because how often are you walking by a half severed foot and get it woofed in your, woofed in your face, waft, waft. I think the correct word is waft. You got wafted. So, uh, you know, just do the best you can. And if you need to excuse yourself, like Captain Shepard, I was talking about earlier that taught me X-ray and CT uh, from Vietnam, he'd seen too much stuff. And if, and if he smelled the wrong thing, he would start, it would start coming up and he'd have to step out and while he was trying to say, I'm stepping out, he was hoo, 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 the whole time he's trying to get out the door. So some people are just hypersensitive and we, we work with that. We're, we're not going to, no, man, you got to x-ray that foot hanging there because I got the last one. We all work together. It's not a big deal. Check in the comments section. You guys are having a great conversation. Keep it up. Uh, right on. Doing good there. So that was Ryan's question. Um Oh, somebody snuck in an advertisement. So what we do is we click turn on post approval for Kushubu and confirm that, which means anytime they post in the future, it has to get approved. And then we'd have removed the post. So now instead of just removing it, because they could come back and go, well, where's my stuff? And post it again. Now I put them on post approval. And they think, oh, I just uh, I just lost track of it. I'll just post it again. And then it goes into my queue. Same here for uh, Ali Ahmed. You are now on post approval. Then my friend Lazar Lazarovsky posted. He always has little pearls of wisdom on our Facebook group. He said, my friend Long Lee asked me, is there any advice you'd give me before taking my registry this Monday? And he said, my best advice to him or anyone else would be go out for a run and get about 40 minutes of weight training in. It'll calm your nerves and clear your head so you can be super focused when taking the exam. I'd only add don't eat junk leading up to your exam. Nutrition and exercise are often overlooked when it comes to mental and emotional performance. And um, that's great advice because oftentimes we just ball up into this. Oh, my God, I got to take this test and we get all. Uh, wound up and it can affect your judgment and your ability to thought process. The other thing I'll add to that, because I have a blog post about getting prepared. The other thing I'll add is, is go find your testing center the night before. Go drive out there and find it and see where it's at because nothing will add more stress to your test taking day than if you wait uh, till, you know, let's say you're, you're on schedule and you're getting ready to head out and then something happens that screws up, screws up your schedule. You got a flat tire or your dog gets out and you got to chase them down or whatever, you get stuck on a phone call, whatever it is, now you're running late, but you can still make it if you hurry, but then you find out that you're not quite sure where it's at, and now you're late, and that's a problem. 
So I always recommend looking around and finding out where it's at the night before. So the next day, you know exactly where you're going. And even if you're running a little bit late, you know exactly where you're going. But try to get there early. 54 minutes. Let's see. Here's another great example of being able to share. Uh, Latiqua said, can any new grads tell me the average starting pay for x-ray tax in the San Antonio or Dallas area? And she got seven comments. Where else are you going to get that kind of information? And then I shared one of my posts. I try to share a post daily on here. Uh, yesterday was, can introverts be successful in x-ray careers? Because I get people saying, you know, I, I don't really like talking to people. I don't really uh, know what to say. It gets awkward. I had somebody contact me one time and said, can you help me get better at communicating? Because it just seems so awkward when we're all sitting around the control room and I don't know what to say. And I feel like kind of an, an outsider. So I worked with them a little bit about the art of conversation, sent them to some of the videos uh, Ted talks and things like that. And, and just, the you know, there's like five basic things to a conversation. There's, there's uh, making small talk about the weather and about the job and about, you know, ask them about their kids and their family, talk about uh, what's going on at work, maybe um, different skills. Hey, did you see that cross table lateral I had to do the other day? Man, the technique was really tough. Anyway, I worked with that person and, and they, they uh, presumably got more comfortable but introverts can absolutely be successful uh, in radiology, and there's a post on that. Uh, before that, it was, what modality should I advance to after x-ray? That's a very common question. I have several videos and posts that talk about the different modalities and what they do. Um, they're all very unique. Some have a little bit of crossover, but they're all very unique. Some require 10 minutes with the patient. Some require two hours with the patient. Um, some give you very basic uh, information. Some give you extremely detailed information. Some you have to know what you're looking at. Others, you just have to know what to take a picture of and let the doctor look at it. A lot of different things there. Some you're on your feet all day. Some you sit down 90% of the day. Um, Samantha posted, just applied to radiology school in New York. Any advice you have would be greatly appreciated. What's your favorite thing about the job and your least favorite? And that's got 20 comments, people chiming in. Um, my advice would be move out of New York because <laughs> it's too expensive. But you, you, you live where you live, I guess, you know. Jim Rohn used to say, if you don't like where you're at, move. You're not a tree. Nella said, hey, everyone, does anyone know how much radiology technologists start out an hour in San Diego? And... Um, mm -hmm. Of course, my response was, I'm sure it's high because the cost of living is atrocious. But uh, three comments on that one. And, and I've got posts, too, on how to figure that out. Um, you can go to the ASRT website and look that information up. Or some people say salary.com. Don't trust salary.com. That's a, that's a conglomerate of everything. They're not going to know what we make. They're trying to say what everybody makes in every job. They're not going to know. Go to the ASRT website or search my blog. Um, Kaylee said, I was wondering if anyone would be able to help me out with figuring out how to start toward my goal of becoming a red tech. I have a high school diploma and we'll be looking to start school next year in California. I'm just having trouble figuring out where I need to start out. And 12 comments on there. Uh, this is the kind of thing that would be great to talk about, like uh, in the clubhouse room, where if she were a member, she could ask her questions and then whoever's on that has information that might help could chime in and we could all talk and kind of round table discussion between ourselves. Um, let's see anyone in Kentucky is the next one. And then here's a good MRI question. Uh, Jen Guerrero said, uh, any MRI techs here, I applied for an MRI program and do not have any medical experience. I initially started off wanting to get into radiology, but really interested in becoming an MRI tech. My question is, is it better off to start off as an x-ray tech, or would it be okay to go straight into MRI without any experience? So here's the interesting part about that, and you old-timers will get it, and, and it's it's maybe a little bit unfortunate, but it's true. We, we had to do it the hard way, and so we're not exactly thrilled about this skip over all the necessities and go straight into MRI. 
but the reality is it's being allowed now. So you can, you can apply to an MRI school and get right in without going to x-ray school, which is new. That's a new thing. You didn't used to be able to do that. Doesn't make sense. It makes sense for the schools because they get more people that way. Uh, it might make sense for the workforce because they might get more people in their MRI suite doing their scans. But is it fair to the technologist to not have any prior knowledge? In this particular case, this person said they don't have any prior medical experience at all. And I think that is a disadvantage, a big disadvantage. I mean, that, that means you don't have any anatomy and physiology, no biology, no medical terminology, patient care, uh, medical law and ethics. There's a lot of stuff that goes into what we do. And so I think you're better off to get some pre-training before going into an advanced modality, but there's nothing stopping you. If you're a rock star and you can handle it and you can go right into an ultrasound program without being a rad tech first, learn everything, get good at what you do and go out and do ultrasounds and just know that you're not going to know as much as the tech in the room next to you who went to x-ray school first. Maybe you can learn off that person. So that's a touchy topic, I think, to some of us because part of it's just the old, well, we had to do it, so so do you, which is stupid. That really doesn't hold water. Um, but what we really know deep down is how much it benefited us by going through both programs. When, when I went to, in the Phoenix market, to get into – the ultrasound program at Gateway Community College, you had to have an ancillary degree to get in. But it could have been one of like five different things. It could have been a CNA, or no, not a CNA, uh, uh, respiratory therapist, an, uh, an x-ray tech, a physical therapist, a nurse, or something else. Um, and these aren't low level, you know, nurses and respiratory therapists, these aren't low level ancillary deals. Uh, like an EKG tech or something like that. These are things that required school and, and, and hours. So it's always in your best interest to learn medical terminology and biology and anatomy and physiology prior to getting into a program uh, because it'll, for one, it'll make that program easier for you, but for two, um, it'll just make you a better overall tech. So I'm sure the comments were, were on fire, <laughs> 24 comments. Uh, be an x-ray tech first, you'll be better for it. And to be ART certified, you must be an x-ray tech. So that's true too. See, these MRI schools, they, they may have a secondary MRI license now, like Amrit or somebody that's offering MRI licenses, but the gold standard is the ART license. It's the same way in ultrasound. The gold standard is the ARDMS. That's who gives ultrasound licenses. But there's the CCI that you can get, or even the ART started giving ultrasound licenses. And I remember when I was in ultrasound school at Gateway, our teacher said, you know, look, if you have a hard time passing the ARDMS, go take the ARTs, because at least it's still a licensure, even though it's not the gold standard. So just be careful if you jump into one of these uh, advanced modality programs without going through all the hoops, without being an x-ray tech first. I'm not saying you can't do it because you can, and you can be highly successful and be really good at what you do, but you're going to be at a disadvantage, at least from the start. And see, there's people that are uneducated saying you can't get into MRI without being an x-ray tech first. Yeah, you can. You can. And, and we've had these conversations on here before. If people would read all the conversations, um, Here's a person saying you can't do MRI with that x-ray first, not where I come from anyway. So there's her caveat. Um, I think what she's thinking is you can't be MRI licensed through the ART, but I think that has all changed. And there's somebody that usually logs on here that knows MRI really well that says, um, yes, you can. Actually, you can. In a state like New Jersey, you can be an MRI tech without going to x-ray. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, there are AS programs or associate programs in ultrasound and MRI only. Yeah. So, and I said I'd talk about this today. So you can do it. Uh, you're at a disadvantage, but you, you can. You, there are ultrasound programs. You can even, if I could go back and do it all over again, I probably would have jumped straight into echo sonography because that's the highest paid, almost the highest paid you can get 
in the sonography world, pediatric uh, echo is, is even higher pay, but uh, Arizona Heart Institute in Phoenix did not require anything prior to get in. Uh, it was just highly competitive. I applied once and didn't get in. But uh, those guys were making huge bucks, and that's all you do is echo. It's one one modality. You know, it's it's the heart of ultrasound, where general ultrasound does the whole body. Um, so, yeah, you can do MRI and ultrasound without being anything else. You just have to be very careful that you learn it really well because you didn't get any prior experience. So we're, we're over an hour. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, it doesn't seem to be any new questions in the comments section. Thanks to everybody for chiming in. And uh, for those of you that are able to make it to the clubhouse uh, room as well, uh, we got six thumbs up. That's great. If you haven't hit the thumbs up yet, please go ahead and do that. And this will conclude our um, one hour Saturday live Q&A that we do. Remember, you can always go to the Facebook group and put your questions on there. You can go to my contact page on my blog and send me a question that route. Some people are hitting me up through Messenger. That's an alternative, although I don't check that as often. Uh, or just come back here next Saturday with some questions and be ready to chat if you'd like a clubhouse invite let me know i'm sitting on some of those for the right people who want to get involved in radiology so there's no radiology conversations happening on clubhouse yet so i'm going to start the first room for radiology on there where we can go and and collectively share our information so without further ado thanks again for coming by and have a great weekend everybody is here to party Hi, greetings and welcome fellow barium intimates, fluoroscopists, and cross-table lateralists. I am your host, and I am not a radiology technician. Nope, I'm a technologist, and I've been in this field long enough to know that just because you came into my emergency room at 2 a.m. with a chronic back pain times six years does not mean the x-ray should be static. This is the Radiologic Technologist Podcast for Rad Tech by Rad Tech. Thanks for listening. Good morning, Idaho. And those of you who may be interested in moving to Idaho, 